Right. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, this year's World Geo Public Lecture Speaker, Andrew Cleddams, who's going to talk about mobile broadband from revitalization. And um, so thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I feel that the Newton Institute has set me an impossible task by giving a public lecture about, um, about equivariant methods in algebraic and differential geometry, which is a specialized topic. Uh, in principle, I was supposed to be speaking to a, a completely general mathematical audience. But then I'm quite alarmed to see so many worthy people in the audience you know, many of whom know much more about these subjects than I do, and I've prepared what is mostly a rather elementary lecture. Um, I'm reassuring myself that um, <clears throat> you've come to this lecture in the same spirit that, uh, that perhaps that uh, worshipers go to church. You don't go to church in order to be informed about the latest developments in religion. <clears throat> when the minister starts reciting the, the creed or the Lord's Prayer, the congregation doesn't interrupt and say, excuse me, we've heard this many times before, we know exactly what it says. Um, <clears throat> you go in order to be reminded of the foundational uh, 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 features of the subject in, in a sort of incantatory way. Um, so I'm going to give a sort of series of incantations about algebraic geometry and about quotient constructions. It's kind of appropriate in a way because quotient constructions in mathematics have a tendency to be quite formal. Um, I believe that, that Wittgenstein, somewhere in the, the philosophical investigations, although I admit that I, I looked for it and I couldn't find it, um, <clears throat> he asks the following question. What is 4 divided by 5? <clears throat> To which the undeniably correct answer is four fifths. <clears throat> Whether or not he actually said this, this I think fits in with a lot of his interests. In mathematics is just a system of tautologies that are expressed in the form of what he called language games. Um, <clears throat> I think the point of this example is that a lot of con constructions, very much including quotients, are, are basically formal in nature. <clears throat> um, this is, the answer is merely a restatement of the question, but one in a way that is, renders it amenable to further computation. So for example, if you have to multiply this by anything with five in the numerator, you don't need to work out the decimal expansion. Um, so of course, the formal construction of quotients in algebraic geometry leads to what's called a quotient stack. Um, and I'm going to say very little about this formal um, side, actually. Um, I'll try to talk about. Um, moduli problems in a way that is more concrete and maybe obscuring the fact that it's all um, uh, formal and, and tautological. Uh, I see algebraic geometry, a lot of algebraic geometry, as being as centering around the problem of, of moduli. Moduli is a funny word because it's a plural word, but it's usually used to describe a, a single thing, a moduli space. So what are moduli, or what is a moduli space? It's simply one that parameterizes objects of some kind on another space, modulo some kind of equivalence. <clears throat> um, and so for the time being, I want to be vague about what, um, even what kind of spaces we're talking about or what category we're in. But um, the most trivial example is simply that if x is any space at all, um, And if the kind of objects that I want to consider are ordered n tuples of points, well, the, the, uh, and if the equivalence between those n tuples is simply a quality of n tuples, then the space parameterizing ordered n tuples of points is, is, is simply the nth Cartesian power, xn. A slightly more interesting example for us, because we have notation for <coughs> ordered n tuples and not for unordered n tuples, is to instead consider the objects which are unordered n tuples of points. And the easiest way to um, make sense out of that in this context is just to uh, introduce a different equivalence on the Cartesian power to say, let's say, that a, a triple like x1, x2, x3 is equivalent to x1, x3, x2. And similarly for all permutations. So what we see is happening is that a group, the group of, of permutations, which is called the symmetric group, is, is acting on this space. And what we want is the space of all orbits, that, or equivalence classes, for the group action. And we can give that, if you wish, if x has a topology, you can give that the quotient topology. 
but this is called the n-symmetric power. Um, <clears throat> what do we get if x is the complex plane? It's maybe a mild surprise. <clears throat> the uh, n-symmetric power is actually, in some sense, the same as the nth Cartesian power. It can be or should be identified with the <clears throat> unordered n-tuples and ordered n-tuples of, of, of complex numbers should be identified, in some sense. And the reason for this is simply the fundamental theorem of algebra. The point is that the, um, <clears throat> any uh, complex polynomial in one variable has, let's say, <clears throat> let's, any, any monic polynomial has, let's say, n coefficients, and the coefficients are ordered, but the roots are not. <clears throat> so, so this equation sets up a correspondence between ordered n tuples of, of uh, complex numbers ai and unordered uh, 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 n tuples of complex numbers bi. Um, so the word moduli classically in, in the 19th century, I guess, referred to coordinates or local coordinates on this moduli space. Um, and the ancients were fond of talking about the number of moduli, which simply means the dimension of this space. So in this very simple example, the ai are the moduli, the coordinates on the moduli space. And the number of moduli, the dimension of that space, is n. <clears throat> this is the question that um, I'm always afraid of students asking or members of the audience asking, which for some reason no one ever asks. It's assumed that if you're talking about a subject that it's in intrinsically interesting. Why should we care about moduli or moduli problems at all? I find this very difficult question about anything in mathematics. Usually, <clears throat> it, any mathematical topic just sheds light on something else in mathematics. But if you're interested in any kind of classification problem, it just means you want to enumerate the um, points in the set. So if the set has some kind of uh, uh, um, additional structure as a space, that can only be helpful. Sometimes you want to prove universal statement about, about all mathematical objects of some kind, and then some kind of geometric, geometrical argument using the, the space might be helpful. Um, and now maybe I should come clean a little bit about what sort of category I'm talking about. Uh, I want to talk about algebraic geometry, complex algebraic geometry, in fact. Uh, so I want to study algebraic varieties <coughs> that is sets defined by the vanishing of one or more uh, complex polynomials in, in several variables. Um, and I want to study maps between them that are given by polynomial functions. Um, <coughs> such maps we call morphisms. A and then um, an important... Uh, um, utility of having a moduli space is that you can use them to study families of whatever objects you parameterize. Um, in fact, you can even define a family as being given by a morphism from an auxiliary space into the moduli space. But what is a family of unordered n-tuples of, of complex numbers, let's say, that's given by a morphism from some space y into the um, n-symmetric power? Um, <clears throat> So uh, you, can, you can use the moduli space to define families. You can also use it to study families. Uh, the number of moduli becomes important here because, for example, you immediately see that if you have a, 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 um, a family of n tuple, unordered n tuples whose, whose dimension is greater than n, then there must be repeats. The same, the same um, uh, n tuple must appear more than once. And um, another possibility is to solve so-called counting problems, enumerative problems. That can be done using some kind of geometric argument on the moduli space. And uh, I don't want to talk about enumerative problems, but I do want to maybe mention one of the, uh, the most celebrated one, ones. Um, suppose that uh, five plane conics are chosen at random. <clears throat> All right, these, of course, I haven't really chosen at random, but suppose that five plane conics, uh, uh, parabolas or, or, or ellipses on parabolas are chosen at random. The question is, how many conics are there which are tangent to all five of these conics? This is the classic problem going back to the 19th century, and of course, I've chosen them so that it's easy to find one. Oops, sorry, these are all supposed to be tangent. But even in this example, it's clear that that's not the only one, and there's going to be another one here. Well, given the purple conics, the number of white conics that are tangent to all of them in the plane turns out to be exactly 
3,264. And, and the history of this problem and how a wrong answer was given and then the correct answer was, um, was found in the 19th century, but not proved rigorously, in fact, until the 1970s. Um, it's a wonderful story. <clears throat> and maybe the last thing that I'll say, just to convince you that these enumerative problems are um, not trivial, uh, <clears throat> is that conics, of course, being defined by quadratic equations, makes sense over any field whatsoever. And instead of the complex field, if we consider uh, uh, a field of characteristic two, <clears throat> then the answer is different. The answer is only 51. This number here is, is 64 times 51, I believe, and so it means that in characteristic two, somehow these, these conics all come together in, in groups of 64. And that also was only established in the, in the 1970s by Israel Feinstein. I don't think anyone cares about the numbers per se very much. The numbers are more a sign that you have a working theory that is able to produce um, uh, <coughs> concrete answers. I was brought up in a sort of the Oxford School of, of gauge theory and differential geometry, and we were taught that the purpose of moduli spaces is to shed some light on the geometry or topology of the original space. Let's say a, the geometry or topology of a symmetric power might shed light on, the, on that of the original space. Uh, but I won't have much to say about that today. Rather, when you get interested in moduli problems, just like anything in mathematics, it seems to take on a life of its own. And so we just say that these problems have intrinsic interest, and it, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what the other reasons are for being interested. <clears throat> All right, so I already gave you the example of a, the, the, the very easy example of a, a um, symmetric power of, of, um, of the line. Let me talk about a a compact example of a quotient construction. Again, an example that is completely trivial to, to the experts, which is that of the construction of, of complex projective space. Um, complex projective space is the set of all lines through the origin in CN, complex lines. Um, but since two points determine a line, and since some um, the line has to pass through zero. The line is completely determined by one other point in Cn minus zero, with the caveat that any two uh, uh, um, points that are scalar multiples of one another determine the same line. So I have to divide this space here by the uh, action of the group uh, C times, um, which is the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. Um, so maybe this is a good time to just review some notation about groups. I've already been using this. So sigma n, as I said, is the permutation group on n elements. It has n factorial elements itself. C times is what I'm calling the non-zero complex numbers, which is a group under multiplication. Then later on, we'll meet these non-abelian groups, um, <coughs> un, which is the group of n by n unitary matrices. And uh, CLN, the general linear group of all invertible matrices with um, complex entries. Um, so all of these groups, I suppose, are, are subgroups of, of that group. Um, but uh, to return to this very simple construction, although it's simple, this is sort of emblematic of what's going to follow, because um, we say that um, that uh, in that construction there in the second line, that the point zero is unstable. <clears throat> for the action of C times on CN. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to give a whole talk about quotient constructions in algebraic geometry without ever carefully defining for you what unstable points are. They simply are the points that have to be discarded if, you are to construct, if we are to construct a good quotient. And I think it's fairly clear that if I want to construct, I mean, the projective space is compact already. Um, if I want to uh, uh, um, construct a quotient of this kind, I need to discard zero to have any hope of getting a good quotient. Another thing I could do, by the way, is to, um, is to restrict my attention to um, to unit vectors in, in CN, and then divide only by, uh, by unit complex numbers. And of course, that, again, will give me the same quotient. Um, 
So I can think of this projective space as a quotient of an odd-dimensional sphere by circle action, all right? Um, <coughs> complex projective space is a complex manifold, and uh, we, write, we tend to write uh, um, uh, points in, in projective space uh, inside brackets. Um, in the case where, um, a, a, of a projective space of dimension one, this can be identified with the Riemann sphere. Um, <clears throat> it's not immediately obvious that the set of lines in C2 could be identified with the sphere in R3, unit sphere in R3. The simplest way to see this is with, is with quaternions. Um, I can think of the space of quaternions as being C2, right, spanned by one and J. And I can think of the unit sphere as lying inside the uh, imaginary quaternions. And then, um, <clears throat> then the map from P1 in this sense to the unit sphere to takes a line to the conjugation of, of the imaginary number I by um, some point of the line. That, that's a bunch of <clears throat> OK. And these general linear groups that I mentioned act on projective space. GL2 acts on P1 in the way that I've written, OK, just by linear maps, basically. And, and GLN acts on Pn minus 1 in the same way. With this understood, if you're bored, you could think about your, what is your favorite way to prove that the n-symmetric power of the Riemann sphere is a uh, <coughs> complex projective space. And in fact, you could even regard this as some alternative way to define those projective spaces. Here's another example of a quotient construction that we see in real life. Maybe you think about it, even if you even if your daily life has nothing to do with algebraic geometry. If I write not just invertible complex matrices, but all n by n matrices with complex entries as little GLN for reasons that I won't discuss, then um, then this group of invertible matrices acts on it by conjugation. Um, <clears throat> The, um, <clears throat> diagonalizable matrices are uniquely specified by their, their eigenvalues, so I get an unordered n-tuple of, of complex numbers from a diagonal matrix. <clears throat> um, therefore, the, the uh, um, appropriate way to define the quotient here is, is as the uh, um, and symmetric power of, of C, which as we already saw was, was Cn. Um, but again, the, the sense in which this is the quotient is, is it has to be properly understood. In this case, I do have to glue certain orbits together. It's not just a set of all orbits, because um, the map to the quotient is given by the characteristic polynomial of the matrix. And there are non-conjugate matrices that have the same characteristic polynomial. Um, all nilpotent matrices, such as this one, that one, and that one, all have characteristic polynomial zero. So the orbits of these things under the general linear group have to be glued together um, before I get a well-behaved quotient. And I refer to such points as, as semi-stable. So again, I want to give a whole talk about this without ever defining unstable or semi-stable points. But the theme that's emerging is that in order to um, construct a good quotient in, in the algebraic sense, you have to discard some points altogether. Those are called unstable. And you have to um, sometimes <coughs> stick other points together. Um, and those such points are called semi-stable. But we want to do this, both of those things, as, as little as possible. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, um, Although both of the issues I raised may seem to make the whole subject intractable, an extensive theory of what was called geometric invariant theory was de developed by David Mumford in the 1960s to do exactly this. And it had many successes. Um, <clears throat> let me just mention two very easy examples. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to see that, that every uh, um, so-called elliptic curve, a Riemann surface of genus 1, may be realized. <coughs> If you think of it as a Riemann surface, as, as a one-dimensional complex manifold that looks like this, I can embed it into P2 as um, the zero set of a cubic polynomial. It has to be homogeneous so that I get uh, um, a well-defined set in, in P2. But um, 
But it's easy to see that, that, um, that uh, as I say here, every Riemann surface may be uh, realized as a cubic in this fashion, uniquely modulo the action of GL3. And therefore, if you want a moduli space of, of curves of this, well, I'm calling it a curve. It's a complex curve on a, a real surface, right? Which is a, um, it's, does it have two real dimensions or one complex dimension? Well, it's both. But, but there's a constant tension in the subject between speaking about complex curves and Riemann surfaces. In any case, the moduli space of such things can be constructed as the quotient of the space of all cubic polynomials, homogeneous cubic polynomials, by the action of uh, GL3. And geometric invariant theory not only tells you what points to kick out, where the unstable points, and what points to glue together, it also will provide you a, with a compact moduli space. So it also will tell you what points to add. Some of these cubics will define a singular curve that does not look like that, and it will tell you exactly what points you need to add in order to get a, a compact moduli space. In the same way, <coughs> every remote surface of genus 3 a Riemann surface with three holes, like this one, may also be realized as the zero set of a quartic polynomial in P2. And again, this is unique modulo the action of GL3. And so again, and these examples are discussed in Mumford's book. Um, <clears throat> Moduli of genus three curves may be constructed as a quotient of this space of quartic polynomials. This very naive approach, unfortunately, doesn't really work for curves of any other genus, including genus 2. There are other approaches that do work, but they're much, much, much more complicated. <clears throat> and I'm going to stick in this lecture to trivialities. It's a little unfair, though, to say that these are complete trivialities, because, as I said, working out what the stability condition is properly for these uh, complicated group actions on complicated spaces um, it, it get, gets, um, gets rather involved. What I want to talk about is about line bundles and vector bundles in an algebraic context. So, so let me try to say again in an uh, intuitive way what those things are. A vector bundle is simply a family of r-dimensional complex vector spaces and I'm always talking about complex geometry, so these are always complex spaces, parametrized by a base space in such a way that as you move around on the base space, the um, vector space depends coherently on <coughs> the point in X. And a line bundle is one where the um, vector spaces all have uh, dimension 1. <coughs> Although I'm talking about complex geometry, the picture that you should always keep in mind is this one of a, kind of a real analog which is um, the Mobius strip. <clears throat> the Mobius strip should be thought of as a family of, of lines <clears throat> parametrized by the circle. <clears throat> in such a way, because the line moves around in a, in a continuous fashion as the point of the circle moves, this, this sort of depends coherently on the point of the circle. But of course, these lines cannot all be coherently identified with the standard <coughs> reference line. This is, the Mobius strip is not uh, um, isomorphic to a, a cylinder. OK, here, of course, I'm fudging the question of what it means to depend coherently. <coughs> Most of you know that the, the um, rigorous definition involves local trivializations. But instead, <laughs> let me take a different approach and say, but first of all, we already have a projective space, and there's clearly a tautological family of lines parametrized by the projective space because the projective space is a set of lines, right? So the tautological uh, family that assigns to a point L in Pn minus 1 that the line L, let's agree that that depends coherently. Secondly, we can pull back if we have a morphism from one... Um, algebraic space to another, then, um, then and, and, and um, we have a <coughs> coherent assignment of, uh, of lines to uh, points in Y, <coughs> then composing that with the morphism gives me a coherent assignment uh, of lines to points in X, and that's called the pullback of the line bundle. 
Finally, we want to make line bundles into something like a group with, um, with the inverse and, and uh, multiplication operations. So, um, <clears throat> so there should be a kind of axiom that says that if, um, that <clears throat> if I have two line bundles, um, two families of, of lines depending coherently on x, then, then so do the dual and the tensor product. Sorry, that should be L sub x, shouldn't it? Um, <clears throat> And somehow, with these three uh, conditions, the, uh, um, I can define what I mean to assign to to, to uh, um, align to a point in some base space in a way that depends coherently on the point in the base. If I yes. No, I, I mean, but that's, I think this is the way that I, I want to pull back from a, <coughs> I have something on the target. I have a assignment of a line to something on the point of the target. Do you want to assign my minus one? I, I, I mean, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. my notation is eccentric, but I think I do, it does mean what I wanted to say. <laughs> And uh, the reason I did it in this eccentric way is to be, you know, um, to avoid all technicalities, or at least sweep them under the rug. Okay, but as you see, this whole point of view depends on having a tautological uh, object on projective space. If I want to make a similar definition for um, vector bundles of rank greater than one, then I need a tautological bundle. And of course, I can, I can find one by defining something analogous to the projective space for the set of all R-dimensional linear subspaces of Cn. That's called the Grassmannian, and it's a complex manifold of dimension R times N minus R. With all this understood, there should also be a moduli space parametrizing all line bundles. Um, <clears throat> but line bundles are, well, <clears throat> They have topological invariants. Every line bundle should be assigned to a topological invariant called a degree. If the base space is a Riemann surface, which is what we've been mostly talking about, then, then um, that degree is simply an integer. <coughs> the degree comes from basically from the topological degree of the map to projective space that is used to pull back line bundles. If I have a, a uh, <coughs> map from a Riemann surface, say, to Pn with topological degree phi, then the degree of L is the degree of phi, up to an annoying sign, because the tautological bundle on Pn somehow is, is, is negative. Moreover, degree is additive under tensor product and so on. With this understood, one can construct a moduli space of, of degree zero line bundles on a Riemann surface. The equivalence is no longer equality. It now has to be something called isomorphism, which means what you might expect is isomorphism between the vector spaces in the problem that, that uh, depends coherently on the base. Um, and the moduli space is called the Jacobian torus. It's a complex torus of dimension G, where G is the genus of, of the Riemann surface, one or three or whatever. Um, uh, and... Um, <clears throat> It can be constructed with geometric invariant theory, but, but that would certainly take us out of the realm of trivialities. How do you introduce a group action and figure out what the stable points are and so on? It's, um, it's uh, a, a more complicated question. Number theorists, in, under the name of arithmetic geometers, they love complex tori like the Jacobian because these are um, algebraic spaces. They're defined by, by equations, but they also um, are groups. Uh, uh, thanks to this structure here. And so when you, you know, uh, number theorists love to look for solutions of polynomial equations in integers or, or rational numbers. Um, if you have two such uh, points on, on the Jacobian and you add them, you get a third such point. And so that's why um, number theorists love um, uh, complex tori and this whole subject opens a vista in the direction of number theory. But I would like to pivot and, and um, open a vista in another direction, which is toward um, uh, uh, classical mechanics. Um, I feel that everyone, including the participants in this program, should be um, constantly reminded 
<coughs> that um, the quotient constructions that we do in algebraic geometry have counterparts in, in differential geometry, and that there should be um, a bridge <coughs> between, um, between algebraic and differential geometry that is opened by, this, by these ideas. Um, in classical mechanics, well, what I understand about it, um, <coughs> Every um, symmetry of a physical system is supposed to correspond to a conserved quantity. The only examples of this kind that you ever hear about are that um, <clears throat> for each um, degree of translational symmetry that you have, you have a, uh, a component of momentum that is conserved. For each degree of rotational symmetry that you have in an experiment or a physical system, you get uh, um, a, a component of angular momentum that is conserved. I was afraid that someone would ask, well, what about energy? And I believe that energy corresponds to some kind of time translation invariance. Um, so those are the three examples that I know, really. Um, but the way that this is used in the, in the uh, um, mathematical formulations of, of classical mechanics are that if, if I have a symmetry group acting on the phase space, the set of all initial conditions of a classical mechanical system, then we expect to have, in good cases we do have, a, a, what is called a moment map, mu, a map which, um, which uh, um, <clears throat> describes for me the momentum or angular momentum or whatever of the system in that configuration, um, <clears throat> which goes from the phase space to a vector space of the same real dimension as the group K. It's the dual of the Lie algebra of K, or the dual of the tangent space of the origin. But the point is that it's a vector space. <clears throat> and uh, the kind of quotient that um, we like to consider in this setting, well, if the, if the um, system starts off having total momentum zero, then as it evolves, it will continue to have total momentum zero. So we can confine our attention to the level set where the total momentum is zero, that's mu inverse of zero. But then we want to divide by the symmetry, and we, and we can study our physical problem on this so-called reduced phase space. <clears throat> the mathematical formulation of this took place, I guess, in the 1980s. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the names that I believe are associated with it are Kempfness, Atiyah Bott, Gilliman Sternberg. But I would be the first to admit I haven't really looked into the history of the matter. My understanding is that some set of people, including these, uh, um, these famous ones, observed that in the situation we were in before, where I have a complex algebraic variety acted on by some uh, group like GLN, that the geometric invariant theory quotient that I invoked before but didn't define can be identified with this reduced phase space, this eclectic quotient, all right? Um, and in fact, we've seen an example of this already with projective space, a very simple example, with projective space. <coughs> yeah, projective space is a geometric invariant theory quotient of Cn by, by C times. But also, the moment map for this action is, is of course, uh, um, v squared minus 1. Okay, And so the inverse image of 0 under the moment map is exactly this le level set here. And if I divide by the real group u1, I'm supposed to get the same thing. That's the sort of baby example. Um, of, the, uh, of this identity here. So here the point is that uh, the unitary group UN is what's called a, you know, a compact form of, of, um, of GLN. It's a, uh, it's a real group contained in this complex group. Um, uh, we, we, we say, in fact, that, uh, that GLN is a complexification of UN. And, and uh, there's this, this circle of ideas applies to the action of any reductive group, G, whatever that is, something I, I won't attempt to define, um, <clears throat> where the role of uh, the unitary group is played by a, a common form. The point is, the broader point is that, as I said, this throws a bridge between <clears throat> algebraic and differential geometry. Um, <clears throat> The thing on the left is defined very much using algebraic methods, polynomials, and so on. The thing on the right is cognate to classical mechanics. Um, and in particular, if a point is in here, um, it means that the value of mu equals 0. And that could be characterized as saying that some differential equation is satisfied by, um, by uh, the configuration at that point. Um, a sharper statement, which is, which is used, in fact, to prove this 
statement up here, whoops, sorry, is that a, a, a point is, is stable or semi-stable for the G action, the, these properties that I haven't properly defined, if and only if the orbit or the orbit closure of X intersects mu inverse of zero non-trivial. And for the experts or those who are watching closely, okay, I know that this statement that I've made it is not quite true. I guess the statement for semi-stability is true. This, the X is semi-stable if and only if the orbit closure of X intersects mu inverse of zero non-trivial. But for, for stable points, something like this is true. If it's a true statement, I didn't, I didn't want to get into the details. Okay. Um, but the point is that the quotient here of an of a open, dense open set that is given by throwing out the closed set of unstable points is identified with a <coughs> quotient of a closed subset. All right, so it's time now to talk about the classic example that appears in Mumford's book, and uh, both in the original version written by Mumford and in the revised version that was uh, brought up by Francis Curlin some years later. Um, general group GL2 acts on the Riemann sphere, right, as we saw, because the Riemann sphere is P1, <coughs> okay? So the unitary group acts by rotations. We identify the Riemann sphere with the, I mean, the, uh, uh, the projective uh, 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 line P1 with the Riemann sphere S2. <coughs> Unitary group acts by rotations. The other elements in here act in some other way. They act by moving the lines of, of um, latitude around, OK? And the Mullen map for the action of this U2 is simply the inclusion of S2 into R3. Now, you might object. I thought it's, the Mullen map is supposed to go into a space of the same dimension as that of the group. This group U2 is dimension four. But the point is that the central uh, uh, diagonal elements here act, act trivially. And so, um, so the moment map goes into a smaller space. OK. Mumford's classic example is about the action of GL2 on x, a product of n copies of P1, acting diagonally. And since so the moment map is just additive, the moment map of mu on an n tuple, and here these are u1 through un are simply unit vectors in R3, OK? In that case, the moment map is just the sum of u1 through un. So the, the uh, moment map condition that, the, um, <clears throat> that this n tuple lie in the uh, uh, zero level set is the condition that a, a, a chain of unit vectors closes up, that they, they form what is called a, a, a three-dimensional polygon. I've never liked that name because I always thought that the word polygon should be reserved for a plane figure. But it does give me the opportunity to play with, uh, you know, to do a little show and tell. This is an example of what we're talking about. Okay, literally, I have six unit vectors here, okay, arranged in such a way that they come back to the origin. And the, the orbits of the U2 action are literally what you get by rotating something like this around. So this is the case n equals six. Um, <clears throat> the stability condition worked out by Mumford is that these points are, a point like this is stable if no more than half of the UI coincide, okay? Um, so, um, uh, the, um, Right. The point is that the uh, right the content of the statement that I made on the previous slide, therefore, is that um, a a configuration is stable if and only if there's some group element that can bring it into the zero center of the moment map, and that's true if and only if no more than half of the the, the points on the unit sphere coincide. If you think about it, one of these directions is obvious. If you have uh, three points that are the same, let's say, let's say n equals five, and I have three points which are the same, that means that I have this long lo line of length three, there's no way that two more unit vectors can take me back to the origin. <coughs> and so that <coughs> shows me that the forward direction is, is true and obvious. But the reverse direction is not so completely obvious, because if you think about it, right, how, how does GL2 even act on P1, right? It's a little bit complicated. Um, nevertheless, this is true. Um, and there are various ways that this example could be generalized, which strangely enough are not in Mumford's book. One is that you can add weights, 
which simply means that instead of unit spheres, I can, I can look at uh, n, different, n, n spheres in, in R3 of different radii, uh, <coughs> AI. And again, GL2 acts on this product of spheres. And again, the moment map is the sum. It's as if, and I thought about cutting or breaking some of these uh, um, sticks in order to, in order to um, illustrate this. But I think you can work it out, right? I have a polygon here, which has edges of different lengths, but fixed. And the same kind of problem. Um, the correct stability condition in this case, is that no more than half of the total weight is supported at any point, which I've, I've um, written like that. Another possible generalization, of course, is to higher dimension. <clears throat> There's actually no reason why I have to confine my attention to uh, GL2 acting on P1. I could look at the action of GLR acting on PR minus 1 and on X, a product of N copies of PR minus 1. The stability condition, if you work it out using Mumford's criteria, it says that an n-tuple is stable. It's not, the condition is not just on whether these points coincide. The question is whether too many of them lie in a, uh, a linear subspace that is too small. So an n-tuple of, of points in projective space is stable. If and only if for every linear subspace of every dimension, the number of points that lie in that subspace over the dimension is less than the total number of points over the total dimension. So to <clears throat> make the analogy between the left-hand side and the right-hand side crystal clear, we can define, given the points vi, we can define the slope of a subspace in CR to be the number of points that lie in the subspace over the dimension of the subspace. And then this condition can be expressed as a slope inequality. It says that the slope of any, sorry, it should say it for all proper linear subspaces, V and CR, that the slope of any proper subspace is less than the slope of the whole thing. OK? <clears throat> now, one nice thing about this moduli problem, this is a moduli problem involving the action of a non-abelian group, GLR. But I can abelianize it. <clears throat> Whatever that means, what does abelianization mean? It does not mean dividing out by the commutator subgroup or anything like that. It means that I can tell you a different moduli problem with an abelian group action that leads to the same quotients. <clears throat> In fact, take the product of n copies of C times. Call that T. That's an abelian group. And that acts on Cn in the obvious way. <clears throat> then these quotients that I was just talking about well, the projective space itself can be described as a quotient of a vector space by a C times action, as we discussed, OK? And now I have n copies like this. I can package them all together and write this as C to the Rn uh, mod t, OK? But now you should observe, really, that t and GLR both act on CRn, and the actions commute. So these quotients are the same as these quotients. And I should think of this as a space of R by n matrices with complex entries, so it's homomorphisms from CR to CN, okay, just linear maps, in other words, from CR to CN. <clears throat> Whenever you have two commuting operations in math, you should interchange the order of the operations, right? That's how you're going to learn something non-trivial. So I want to divide first by the GLR action, then by T, in, in contradistinction to what I did up there. And then you recognize this thing as a generalization of the construction we had at the beginning. <clears throat> this is a, a geometric invariant theory quotient that leads to the Grassmannian. I think it's fairly obvious that this, well, intuitively obvious that the stable points will be the ones, the linear maps having maximal rank, and that the only um, invariant of a linear map after I um, <clears throat> uh, divide out by the change of basis on the domain is the image of the map, which is a, a subspace in the Grassmannian. OK, so what I've converted, <coughs> what I've done is converted this quotient problem into a quotient problem of a torus. <coughs> well, if we call this such a thing a torus, a, a product of C times acting on a Grassmannian. And I, <coughs> as we discussed, I can, I can introduce different weights. I can, <coughs> uh, um, I can hybridize the two different generalizations I have before. And so there are, in fact, many quotients of this corresponding to different weights on the different factors. 
Those correspond to different characters of the torus or different values of the moment map. I could look at mu inverse of t mod t, and I get, in fact, the whole family of quotients over here, which parameterizes them, which is the same as the family of quotients there. And this is the this identity is what was known as the Gelfand McPherson correspondence some time ago. Um, I want to say one word now about the. <coughs> there is a tautological construction, as I said, of quotients in algebraic geometry, a, a so called stack theoretic quotient. It's an interesting phenomenon that although all of the invariant theory quotients, as I was trying to explain, are the same here and here, you can also just take a tautological quotient of this thing by this thing or this thing by this thing, a stacky quotient, which I won't attempt to define. I will just say that the stacky quotient remembers a great deal, just like four-fifths doesn't remember everything about four and about five, because four-fifths does equal eight-tenths, OK? But the stacky quotient does remember all of the points in the original um, space and all of their isotropy groups. Um, so, so the stacky quotients here, here are not the same. Um, this has one very bad point, very unstable point, or a rather unstable orbit, which is the small diagonal. And this has um, n choose r fixed points, okay, which are the, um, the linear spans of, of the uh, coordinate subspaces. So, um, so our stacks are quite different, and I think it would be interesting to elucidate what the relationship between those stacks um, actually is. All right, enough about that. I just want to say this abelianization construction tells you something. Because once you have an abelian group acting, there's a large machine, which again, I don't have more, you know, any time to describe, that, that um, kicks in. And you can say lots and lots of things about, about abelian group actions. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the action of that torus on that Grassmannian has then choose our fixed points. For example, now, I mean, now that we have a differential as well as an algebraic interpretation of the quotients, they're Ramanian manifolds, they have volumes, Ramanian volumes, and there's a formula for the Ramanian volume that is given by this wonderful Deussermatt Heckman formula as a sum over fixed points. Okay. I don't want to talk about what this so-called equivariant Euler class is in the denominator. Um, suffice it to say that once, once you abelianize, you can go to town and you can compute things like these volumes in terms of the sum over fixed points. That it's actually the Fourier transform of the Ramanian volume. So, so T is the um, point at which you take the quotient. Tau, I guess, is a dual variable. And this is a, the Fourier transform, which is a function of these taus. And you know, I really hope that this formula is at least approximately right. I'm sure there are signs and factors missing and so on. Um, but that's at least what it looks like. And of course, you can simplify this further using the theory of symmetric polynomials. OK? To also say that there is a so-called non-abelian localization due to Jeffrey and Kerwin, and you could apply that directly to the um, original problem rather than abelianizing. But in my view, you're always better off abelianizing when, when you can. <coughs> in the remaining time, I want to go <coughs> in a further direction and talk about, I already talked about moduli of line bundles. I want to talk about a very analogous situation, although it's certainly more abstract, which is vector bundles on a Riemann surface. I already told you that a <coughs> vector bundle on a Riemann surface has a, an integer invariant, which is its degree. But it has an even more fundamental integer invariant, which is its rank. That's just simply the dimension of the um, vector spaces that it parameterizes. Okay? And I can divide one by the other, and I get a rational number, which we can define to be the slope. <coughs> I'll say that a vector bundle on a Riemann surface is, is semi-stable if all proper subbundles, which again I haven't really defined, but it means families of subspaces that vary in a coherent way, um, <clears throat> satisfy this slope inequality. <clears throat> stable if it's if the strict inequality is always satisfied, and semi-stable if there's sometimes a tie. Then geometric invariant theory, and this was another victory, I guess, of the uh, theory in the 60s, um, construct a space, a, a algebraic space, an algebraic variety, uh, uh, parameterizing all such bundles up to isomorphism. Once you fix the numerical invariants, the rank and degree. And the Jacobian torus that I talked about before is the case of rank one and line bundles and degree zero. 
Um, there's been very, very extensive work in the last four or five decades on the geometry and topology of this space. The only thing that I want to highlight, because it's just irresistible to mention at this point, is that there was an infinite dimensional version of this whole circle of ideas that was pointed out by Atiyah and Bott in the early 80s. They gave us, if you like, a moment map. There was a, a, an algebraic construction, but there's also a um, differential geometry construction of the same space that I just mentioned. Uh, um, as a quotient of an infinite dimensional space of connections on the bundle by a, an infinite dimensional group of, of gauge transformations. Now, what a connection is, I better not say, but it's a very fundamental uh, um, structure in differential geometry, right? And the space of all um, uh, connections on the bundle is an infinite dimensional affine space. The role of the moment map is now played by the curvature of the connection. Again, better not say what that is, but that's a, it's hard to imagine a more fundamental idea in differential geometry than curvature. <clears throat> the, the, as I said, the, the identity between the algebraic quotient and the symplectic quotient is supposed to say that every algebraic object admits a solution of some differential equation. And in this case, <clears throat> what it means is that a stable vector bundle has a solution, uh, a, a, a connection which, which uh, solves the equation f equals zero, a flat connection. <clears throat> that was the uh, content of the narasimhan shashabi theorem, which had been proved long before by Donaldson, who was um, a TS student in the early 80s, um, you know, as a prelude to his um, celebrated work on four manifolds, he reproved the narasimhan shashabi theorem, which says that on a Riemann surface, a vector bundle is stable if and only if it admits Let's just say a flat connection. The, the slogan form of the theorem you should remember is that stable bundles are the ones admitting flat connections. There are two technicalities. One has to do with the distinction between stability and semi-stability, which is always a, an irritant. The other is that um, for topological reasons, bundles of degree zero, sorry, of degree non-zero can't have flat connections. But you can ask that the curvature be spread out as evenly as possible. So, so the truth is that if the degree is not zero, what this theorem says is that is the stable bundles are the ones having connections of central constant curvature. Now, what I want to tell you in the remaining time, and I've, I've artfully arranged so that I have almost no time. You know, I, I brought you up to the year 1980, I guess, in the, in the first um, however many slides. In the last few slides, I want to talk about um, my own interest in, and you know, uh, uh, developments that are going on more recently. But I want to be as sketchy as possible. Um, <clears throat> we can't abelianize the problem on the previous slide. There's really only one stability condition for vector bundles on curves, whereas the um, abelianization that we saw in the gelfand mcpherson correspondence, for example, rested on the possibility of having weights on different factors that we moved and adjusted. Um, it's really because um, <clears throat> what we start out with is a product of projective spaces, and we can put different weights on those different factors. We don't have anything like that um, <clears throat> in the present situation. So instead, we need to enlarge the problem and study some kind of decorated structure, additional structure on, on the vector bundle. There's been a gigantic amount of work on this, by, again, by many of it by member, much of it by members of the audience. All right, but the, the one that I propose is to study R tuples of bundles, E1 through EN, where the rank of EI is I, and where the maps between them are generically injective. That means, that is to say, I have uh, linear maps between the uh, vector spaces parameterized by these bundles, which are generically injective, or again, in, uh, to, to use the um, language that the experts will understand, that, um, that uh, these maps are injective as maps of coherent sheaves. There actually will be about two n different parameters that could be used to study stability now. So, so now we're in the situation where I, can, where I have many different structures and I can put different weight on those structures. Um, I have n bundles, but I also have n maps. OK, the first map is coming from 0. But I mean, I can put different weight on, weights on the bundles and different weights on the maps. So I have about 2n or maybe 2n minus 1 stability parameters, alpha i and beta i. Okay, 
And if you work out what the stability condition is for these things, there's just as uh, with the weighted stability condition I mentioned in the, in the toy model, there are a family of stability conditions depending on these parameters alpha i and beta i. This term is clearly what you get from cross multiplying the slope inequality, right, for, for ei. Um, so if I set, you know, ai equal one and everything else equal zero, I would just recover the stability, classical stability condition for ei. <coughs> this one is more like the, you know, the, the uh, what you get for, by thinking about um, <coughs> e, yeah, um, the, um, this whole structure is defining for you a flag in the, um, at the generic point of, of E. Um, <clears throat> so the general case is sort of a hybrid of these, these two things. Now, what I can prove is that there is a smooth complex manifold, okay, <clears throat> parametrizing um, uh, um, diagrams of this form subject to some mild stability condition, which I like to call pre-stability, okay? Um, but also rigidified in a way, um, you have to just, again, as in the toy case, you have to pass to something um, a little bit bigger before you have a, a torus action to divide by. So I do that by fixing the determinant. Um, and now I really am going to uh, take the gloves off I, and, and, and say that the, um, the quotient of uh, uh, the successive quotients of one of these things by the next might not be a, a vector bundle, it might be a coherent sheaf. And what I have to do is look at the determinant of that sheaf and, and fix an isomorphism to a fixed line bundle. This kind of construction happens in this theory of vector bundles all the time, it's called fixing the determinant. But the difference is that I'm now doing it for all of the bundles that occur in this whole picture. So I, I'm fixing uh, our different determinants. Oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> n equals r. <laughs> yes, here it goes up to n, here it goes up to r. So from now on, let's just say that n equals r. Um, <clears throat> the point is that the there is a torus action on this space, on this smooth space that I mentioned before because one of the objects that I have is an isomorphism of one line bundle to another one, and I can just multiply that isomorphism by a scalar. Um, so I have a torus action, and um, if I take different quotients, take, uh, um, if you wish, at different level sets of the moment map, I get a family of moduli spaces with the stability conditions that I uh, uh, wrote down before. One of these, I mean, as I said, if I put all of the weight on, um, uh, uh, um, if I let alpha r, I guess, be 1 and all the other uh, parameters be 0, then stability of the whole thing is equivalent to stability of, of er. And so for that quotient, I can forget all of the other stuff, and I get a map to um, the moduli space of, of rank R stable bundles, the and the fibers are connected, um, which is not uh, uh, immediate, but it turns out to be true. On the other hand, there's another degenerate extreme uh, uh, choice of the parameters for which the, um, for which <coughs> what I get is sort of easy to understand. It's what you might call a tower of projective bundles. I start with a projective space. I have a vector bundle over that projective space. I take a, um, quotient of that vector bundle by the C times action, then I have a vector bundle over that, and I take another quotient by the C times action, and so on. That's what we might call a tower of projector bundles. It's easy to understand topologically and from every other point of view. Or to look at it another way, on this smooth space M, I can ask, as I did before with the Grassmannian, but what are the fixed points of the torus action? The fixed points are not they're finite in number as they were before, but there are finitely many connected components, and, and they are products of symmetric powers of the original Riemann surface X. And so it's a tractable picture. <coughs> Joyster, Mount Heckman, and all of the many other um, statements that surrounded it um, that have been around for a long time can be applied, and um, <coughs> informa information can be deduced about the <coughs> original object of study the space of uh, stable vector bundles on a curve. 
Now, as I said, there's been extensive study. I mean, a lot is known about this already. So what can we evaluate? Can we can find the volumes of these spaces? Well, those are known, and those have been known for a long time. So it's not totally clear that um, this new approach actually yields new information. I'll concede that right now. But um, what it may do is provide a new way of organizing the existing information. Uh, a lot of... Uh, formulas about these spaces are known, they largely were proved by induction on the genus of the Riemann surface X. And, and whereas this approach, as you see, is more gives you some kind of induction on, 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 the, on the rank of the vector bundle. Um, and, and so it's my hope that, uh, although to be honest, um, I fully understand the situation really only for n equals two, <coughs> it's my hope that this will lead to some inductive formulas that are inductive in n for the same kind of quantities that we already evaluated um, using other means uh, long ago back in the 1990s. All right, I, that's all that I have to say, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. You all want to get to the wine. <laughs> I should be asking you. I mean, there's, as I say, so many in the audience who know more about this than I do. I should be asking you questions. But one thing I certainly would like to talk about is about the uh, um, stacks that appear as these quotients in the Gelfand Victors and correspondence, and what relationship, if any, there is between them. Thanks very much again.